those sentences where um, Jacob have I loved and and you know it's like that's to uh, that's to that's yeah yeah Jacob have I loved Esau have I hated like this is to include me it's not to exclude me like that shows that God can include who He wants to that he, remember we said He jumps out of the Levitical system he jumps out of the law and he jumps into a new system and this is a place where i can actually be included inside of and this is you could say what you know romans chapter 9 10 and 11 are about it's like god provoking the jews with his jealousy like he's including somebody else because god jumped out of his levitical system does that make sense alicia does that make sense we, we want to understand that because that's the only way we can understand grace because we are prone to live in a system. And if we live in that system, we become frustrated in Christianity, right? Because we don't jump out of that system that is available to us. We don't enter into that new man, right? So this is, this is why that's so important. Jacob have I loved? Well, that's great. And Esau have I hated? That shows the nature of God. It's not best, it's not, it's not based upon the family that you were born in. It's not based upon that you were the, the nation that had all the secrets, that had the, you know, had the tabernacle, that had the, the promises of God that, you know, so you jump out into another system, right? Do we get, we want to, we want to get that because that's what gives me hope. Do, do, do we get, we see that, right? We see that, right? Rachel, we, do we understand that principle? Okay, good, because we want to we wanna get that. Um, uh, that's what makes the difference in our lives, okay? Okay, so that's a little bit of a review, what we talked about um, last week, okay? And so we said that we were going to talk about the qualifications of the elder, of the bishop, of the bishop. Um, and I just said the word elder, I just said the word bishop. Okay, Father, we already prayed, but Lord, um, make what we learn useful forever. God, we're not perfect God, what we're submitting to you. God, perfection is only in Christ. It's not in us. And bless this evening in Christ's name. Amen. Um, elder and bishop. Does anybody have any? I tell you, that's confusing. Does anyone agree with me? Is that confusing? Elder and bishop, you know, who, right? It's like confusing. Um, I will explain it, and then if I get stuck, I won't get stuck, but to clarify it more, I may ask Pastor Kimo, um, because this is, this is something that I don't know if I ever really understood, and you know, you hear the word bishop, and maybe we dis... That word is episcop... Yeah, the word episkopos, okay? Over, epi, over. Scopos is, you know, like to look through a scope, something like that. You know, an overlooker, an overseer. Episkopos, episkopos, e, E-P-I-S-K-O-P-O-S, episkopos. Okay, and that is, you know, that's the word for a bishop. An elder is presbyteros, presbyteros, okay? Pres, P-R-E-S, B-U-T-E-R-U-S, presbyteros, okay? You could say the, the, um, the, uh, the presbyteros, the elder, it represents more like a, a character, like an, a person that is, like you could say elder, older, but also uh, developed in nature, also in character, okay? 
That's presbyteros. That's the word for elder. Okay? And we see that, that word in, Acts, in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Okay, I want to see, we see that. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we see the word bishop, which is episkopos, okay? Overseer, representing more of an office. One represents more of a character, and one represents more of an office. Bishop represents more of an office. Okay, and just so we see, get an understanding of this, because in where do we, you know, where do we get, you know, uh, leadership or, or who has authority in the church? You know, are we forgetting something because we don't call somebody a bishop? You know, that might be one of your thoughts, right? Are we like leaving something out because we don't have a bishop in our church? Right? Do you follow me? Is that, I mean, could be a question. What, I saw Rachel. Where's Rachel? Right. What what kind of question do you like? How, what's the question in your mind? Like, is it maybe like you want to put it together? Maybe we want to put it together, right? Okay. So turn to Acts chapter twenty. Verse seventeen. Paul in Miletus is calling. Verse 17, he sent to Ephesus and he called the elders to the elders of the church. What the elders of the church, this is the word presbyteros, okay? Presbyteros representing these are these were the leaders in the in the church in Ephesus, and he wanted them to come over because he's thinking this is the last time I actually am going to be able to speak to them. So that's the word elder, presbyteros. And we see he has this ministry to these men. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, I, I can just read this. This is really kind of part of it. Well, maybe, I, maybe we'll come back and read it later. Um, and, when, and, and, when, and, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, you know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner... I have been with you all seasons. Okay, and then he's speaking to these men, and then we see in verse uh, 28, okay? Okay. He's going to be warning them about the wolves, about uh, the people that are, 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 are in the flock, and uh, he, he's warning them. And this is in verse 28. He says, Take heed, therefore, Take, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, okay? And this is, this is the word there, um, episcop episcopas, okay? The word for bishop, okay? And so he's referring to the two men with this... And he gives them the same men, the same group of men, he's giving them the same title, okay? At first, he addresses them as elders, presbyteros, in verse 17. In verse 28, he addresses the same group of men as, as bishops, okay? One, you could say the elders in representing their character and the, the bishops representing their office, overseers, Okay, this is the same group of men. So, um, when we, this might like help with, let's say, Rachel's question, if we had the same question, the qualifications we say of the elders, and we read, we read in um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read the word bishop. So now you know where it comes from. There's an association. These terms were actually used interchangeably. Okay, and actually, um, there is a distinction in the terms actually later in the church, maybe in the, later in the first century, okay? There's a distinction that was actually created in these terms, okay? And that is something that uh, you could say was man-made or it's not in the scriptures. Um, the word elder, we have the word elder, actually that is 
like a derivative or a passed on down through from, from Hebrew, from, uh, from the Jews. So we have a little bit of an understanding. I didn't confuse you, did I? Okay, did I? Did I? <laughs> does, that, does that help you a little bit? Okay, so it's like you could say it's the same people being, being referred to with two different names. You know, bishop, an over, overseer, an overseer, and also uh, an elder, uh, a person with a uh, mature in character. Okay, something like that if you want to look at it like that. Does that help you? Okay, good. So let's, let's turn to um, let's turn to First uh, Timothy chapter three, then. And then maybe, do we have a microphone? Okay, and then Pastor Kimo, if you could explain something about poiemen, okay, okay, come on up and explain something to us about poiemen. So, and poiemen is the word for shepherd. Okay, it's the word for shepherd. Okay, we want to we want to understand. Isn't it good to understand this? Do you guys like this? Like, we want to understand this. Okay, go ahead. Son? No? You can hear. Okay. Yep. Poimen is uh, one of the words that is used uh, in the New Testament referring to leaders. Also, by the way, the Old Testament equivalent is also likewise used. That word translated into Latin actually ended up as the English word as pastor. So that's the origin of the word pastor. But it means shepherd. Someone who shepherds usually sheep or small cattle originally. And um, that was used already in the Old Testament as a metaphor for a certain kind of leadership. The kind of leadership that actually takes some care of the metaphorical sheep. In other words, those people that follow the leader. It's used, uh, for example, in Ezekiel as politi about political leaders, like are they taking care of the people they lead, the nation, or are they just trying to take advantage of them? Like are they shepherds or real shepherds or not? So it is a metaphor of uh, the kind of leadership that looks after the best of the people that are being led. And that is the kind of message we find also in the New Testament, for example, John 10, about Christ being the good shepherd. And um, uh, so in that sense, it's a very appropriate metaphor to speak about uh, the kind of leadership that the church is supposed to have. They're supposed to be shepherds. I think um, every uh, elder, every leader in the church should in some way be a shepherd. Every pastor should be a shepherd. Um, are there shepherds who are not pastors, who are not um, elders? I would say yes. You, it's kind of the ministry you have to people. You can help them, support them, be a shepherd to them. Uh, but then the church has maybe some people who have been kind of like more designated as leaders like the elders and so on. And um, that applies to them. The word shepherd is used in Ephesians 4.11. There's like this uh, description of ministries God, uh, God gave to the church like apostles, evangelists, prophets. And then it says shepherds and teachers. And um, there's some debate on on that why shepherds and teachers are put together. I think they are put together because they refer to the same person. And um, for those who read commentaries are more scholarly minded, that is not because of Granville Sharp rule in Greek grammar. 
Because some people say it is because of that, and they show that, that the grammatical rule doesn't apply, and they think the case is dismissed. But it's not on the basis of that rule that I'm making the comment. But anyways, I think they refer to the uh, ministry some people have of teaching, and as they teach, at the same time, they are shepherds, they are leaders who care for the people. and um, Or you can say they are leaders who care for the people, and that is manifested also in their teaching. Thank you. I hope that helps you. Does that help? Okay, good. So we have the word. Thank you, Pastor Kimo. So we have the word a pastor. We have the word um, elder. And we have the word um, bishop. Okay? And uh, he said in Ephesians chapter 4 that the pastor teacher is one, you know, is one person. Okay? And... Um, the Greek words, again, for bishop is, what is it? Episcopos, okay? Poiamen is pastor. And the elder is presbyteros. You think of the Presbyterian church, right? Okay, good. Okay, so we have an, we have an understanding of that. I think that's good. That's very good for us to understand this. Otherwise... What are we actually talking about? Who are these qualifications for, right? So we, we have understanding in that. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 3. Okay. This is a true saying, is a man desire the office of a bishop? Episcopos, he desireth a good work. And what could we say? What could we say about that? I said a little bit last week. But um, this is speaking of it is a work, um, it is a commitment, it is something that uh, uh, it, it is an accountability in someone's life. Um, it requires the ability of God. It's not the ability of man. You know, uh, like these are the aspects of, of, a, of an overseer. Um, it's where he's not just uh, accountable for his own life, but he's extremely accountable for other people's lives. Uh, as a pastor, um, as Pastor Kimo said, he's leading sheep. And what type of pastor is he actually? And you know, we'll get into that uh, today. So um, this is extremely, it's extremely important. It, he's leading people into their eternal, it, you know, he's leading their, his people to, you could say, to um, their eternal destiny with, with rewards, to glorifying God. Um, he's leading them in terms of their value that they see themselves in the body of Christ. Okay, he's... He's opening up their eyes uh, through the scriptures, okay, so that they can see um, the glory of God. So the, a pastor is, you know, he's leading them to still waters. He's showing them, you know, the, the mercy, the green pastures. He's feeding them. He's feeding them spiritual food so that they can grow. And it's vital how the pastor actually leads people. Okay, it, and this is, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, through the course of the qualifications, I think we'll talk about these things. This is very interesting. This, this actually um, determine it can determine, um, well, it determines, it can determine my glory in heaven, you know. Uh, it determines my joy on this earth. It determines who I am. It determines the foundation. It, 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 you know, the, the 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 pastor can actually determine the foundation which I I uh, I, I live on. Okay. Um. So let's go. Let's start with the first one. A bishop then must be blameless. Okay. And if we see that word, um, must be blameless. And if we see the end of the qualifications here. In verse 7, look at verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that, are, that which are without, lest he fall into reproach unto the snare of 
the devil, of the slanderer. He could be slandered. His life could be slandered. And there's this word blameless. I want to look, I just want to look at something in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17. Let's turn there. Like, like, literally, the isn't there is isn't there what is that 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 Danish guy that wrote the story of the ugly duckling? Wasn't that a story? What what did he follow? What's how does it go? Was it a duck following geese or was it a duck? Fo- what was that? What a swan following what ducks? Okay, so that's, you know, this is um, what is, remember, there was a, a, a something about uh, the pig uh, in, in New Zealand. Gabe, Gabe, didn't he have an identity crisis also based upon where he was? Now, do, you, do you follow me, what I'm saying? How I'm led will determine my identity. If I'm, if I'm, you know, I could be led incorrectly, I should be a sheep. And if I'm led incorrectly, you know, just say I turn into a, a cow or something worse, I turn into a wolf because of how I'm actually led. It's very important how I'm led. Okay, so that's why these, this, the office of the, of the, of the bishop, of the, of the, we're going to say the overseer, we'll just say the overseer is very important here. So in, I said, uh, Proverbs uh, 18, verse 17, let's just consider this for a moment when we think about the word blameless. Because, okay, let's, okay, okay. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just. Okay, when, imagine this as a leader, okay? That you think that um, I am first. Where Christ said, you know, like the, the greatest among you, let him be a servant, okay? You know, and um, the it says it says here. I I, I want to think about that for a second. He that is first in his own cause seems just, like he becomes blind, like if he thinks that he's beyond reproach, beyond falling. If he is beyond, like if he's like you could say, he, sometimes he like believes, like he's you could say infallible, like you say like like the Pope or something like that, that he believes that like, um, like he is the truth, you know, like he is the way, like his, he's first and like his way is the only way and he loses sight, he loses sight of who God is and this is in verse 17 in verse 17, it says, but his neighbor cometh and searches him. It's like his neighbor says, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But imagine he's like, doesn't really want to, he doesn't really want to like hear that. His neighbor comes and says like, wait a minute, this isn't just, this isn't correct. And he may not want to actually hear that. So it's very important how a leader actually leads in the, in this incredible humility before God, in this in this place of of brokenness, of trusting in the grace of God, because it's actually not the pastor's sheep. We'll see in First Peter chapter five. It's God's sheep. We can actually turn there right now. Let's turn there to First Peter chapter five. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 5, okay, the elders, this is good use of the words that we learned, the elders, presbyteros, which are among you, I exhort, 
it's kind of neat we learned these words tonight, right? The elders, these like these, you know, these men with character. Okay, I exhort, whom am I am also an elder, like that word is like a co-elder. I am with you also as an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. This is what he says: feed the flock of God. Um, uh, um, you don't twist people's will. Like this is the first institution that God has given man, and you don't twist or manipulate people's will. The greatest, you know, the greatest tool that God has chosen to, uh, to influence man's will or for man to choose him is actually love. And we know in First, first Corinthians chapter 8, like we knowledge puffs up. If knowledge is at chap, chapter 8, verse 2, I believe, it, knowledge puffs up and it makes you pride. It's, it's something, it's something um, that can actually be, be followed. You can, you can have like this incredible knowledge, this, this like um, a display of knowledge where um, people are awed by it. And, you know, they've, they've, you know, and they just, they could follow knowledge and they could just think like, like the, this part of their brain is just getting filled with knowledge and it's not actually being fed spiritually, right? And this can puff people up. People can enter into pride because of this. Okay? But it says in the next verse, if any man love, if any man love, 1 Corinthians 8, 3, the same is known of him. Now this is, this is how... God can actually use, or God can use pastors to influence people, okay? Um, we're not here to um, make people like us. We're not here to have people, um, like, create a program that I can glory in. You know, a pastor isn't creating something that he can actually glory in himself. You know, and that's not his goal. Like, you know, if his cause is first, okay, you know, and he thinks it's a just cause, and then, you know, all of a sudden, there's like, there's like people, you know, wait, wait a minute. You know, he, you know, he wants the glory, and he's trying to eclipse God like Satan tried to in Isaiah chapter 14. So all of these, you know, all of these, you know, this is like any type of ministry. If I try to draw disciples unto me, you know, I feel really, wow, well, they really like me. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I use words, and you know what? They really like me. I'm using ministry, and I'm gathering people to myself, and they really appreciate me. I think they appreciate me more than they appreciated them. We don't draw people to ourselves. Like this is an incorrect ministry. We're lifting up Jesus Christ. That's how people's snake bites are actually going to be, are actually going to be healed. And this is how God, he, he leads us to a large place. He leads us to this large place where we're drawn we're drawn by love. Okay? So this is First Peter chapter 5. And we're just, you know, we're thinking about the word blameless. This is, don't you see how important this is? This is like makes me excited about church now. I know what I'm doing. I'm not just with a bunch of group of people that are just saying, yeah, a bunch of cheerleaders, you know, like, man, look at us. We got the best social club going in the city of Baltimore. You know what I mean? I'm not a part of that. I have a pastor, and we're following God together, and my volition is being influenced by the words that are spoken from the pulpit and by the edification out here. And it's affecting my eternal destiny, and it's affecting my joy on this earth. So now we're like, we're all kind of excited. We're not just part of this abstract group of people that all of a sudden we hey, this isn't so good anyway, if we're following like that, right? Do you see what I'm saying? We get, 
disappointed because what we thought was really good actually isn't affecting my life. And then I get actually, you could, yeah, I get disappointed or I get disenchanted. So, um, the, you know, if we think of this in terms of a pastor, uh, a shepherd, the way that he's actually leading sheep, just to read a few, just a few more words there. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight. There's the word, episkopos, it's, the, it's actually the, the verb or a, a modification of the verb. And that, so that, there we see that word right there. You know, you take oversight. Not by constraint. And there's this word, this word there, constraint, not compulsory. We don't take oversight. I'm in charge, so therefore you submit. It's like, you know, which regime is that? Where is the liberty in that? Do you know what I mean? We don't oversee people like that. You know, I did it with my kids, and it, does, it doesn't work that well. You know, we have enforced discipline. We give them rules. But we're always, any parent is always developing free volition. You know, they're always learning how they can give. They have boundaries, but they're learning how they can develop their free volition. And this is a pastor. He wants them to have this liberty to actually use their volition before God. When we walk out of those doors, we're living before God. Now it's exciting 24 hours a day. It's not this little, you know, exercise on Wednesdays and Sundays. Okay, this is kind of, now I, you know, this is like interesting to me. You know, like what does this mean? Okay, um, feed the flock, to, not by constraint, but willingly, like voluntary, voluntarily, not for filthy lucre, but of a, a ready mind. Like you're, you're not motivated by your, what's something that you could gain. It's not, you're not in it for yourself. That's an, another amazing point of an elder. He's not in it for his personal benefit. When he looks for his personal benefit, he will begin to limit his desire to lay down his life. His life will become precious to himself, and he will begin to save his life. And the others, the others in the body of Christ, will become problems. There will become jealousy. There will become envy. There will become strife among us when we are not laying down our lives because we're always looking to try to save our lives. Okay, so neither being, there it is, uh, neither as being lords, you know, like the controller over God's heritage, God's inheritance. You know, these, you know, like you can teach a Sunday school class, you know, in two different ways. This is my class where it's like, hey, these are God's kids. These are, you know, they're mom and dad's kids. And I have this amazing opportunity to give them something from God that will stay with them forever. I remember my Sunday school teacher, and I remember I, what she said, and I remember what a pastor said when I was in eighth grade. He made us draw pictures. I don't remember what he said. I remember the order that he, he made us make these books, and I love that. And it's like we get to impart something to a kid, and we don't know what we're imp When we live like that, can't the Holy Spirit use us more than when we're, we're controlling? We have such a limited like, sphere of influence when we're controlling. When we're, when we're um, voluntarily doing this, um, we have such a, a, a dynamic of God can bless it, God can add, God can multiply in our ministry, and there's no limit to what our ministry can actually do. Okay? The Lord's are but being examples, you know, uh, examples to the flock. And this is, you could say, in Acts chapter 20, when, when Paul brought those elders, which he also called bishops, 
together, those same men, he, he spoke about how he was an example to them and for them to actually follow it. Okay. Now, so we've, we haven't exhausted that. We could, and when the chief shepherd, there it is. <laughs> when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall, re, he, you, not he, Christ isn't going to receive a crown of glory, but you will receive a crown of glory. Okay, is this good? Do you guys like this? This is interesting, isn't it? Are you guys interested in this? I like this, okay? So we've only covered the word blameless, okay? So let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. Okay, the husbands of one wife. Um, this is always a problem, right? This is, all, you know, this, not, this isn't a problem as, as much of a, like, a sexuality is a problem, okay? Relationships are a problem, right? You follow me? Like, there's, there's marriage, sometimes there's divorce, sometimes there's adultery, sometimes there's fornication. And remember, Pastor Brian, on, on Wednesday night, you know, our love determines our hates. And maybe this is even something that Paul is expressing here, that, you know, this, the, the uncleanness, you could say, of the, of the churches around Ephesus and these leaders, that, the churches that they were leading, the uncleanness, whether in mind or action, that these men actually had. If you say something like, you know, you know, by the way, this almost this qualifies us like a, a woman cannot be an elder right here, the husband of one wife. Okay? This is, you know, besides chapter two, but this is also another verification that a woman cannot be, uh, he's addressing men here, that a woman cannot be a, an elder or a, uh, an overseer. Okay? A poeman, a pastor. Um, this, this, Let's look at, uh, we'll just read this and then we'll take a break. But so we're seeing like character. You know, this, I keep thinking of the rich young ruler. Like, I didn't do, but he's so focused on what he didn't do, he thought he was qualified where God was after his heart. And this is, you know, we can never replace that issue with the qualifications of an elder. We never can make a list and say, therefore, you are qualified. Right? Okay, we, we believe in the, the mystery of godliness. I said we were going to go to uh, Proverbs chapter 6. Remember, we're talking about, because, you know, we could talk about, obviously, it's a husband of one wife. You know, was he divorced? You know, uh, we, it was, they're not, you know, it eliminates polygamy. But let's go deeper than that. Okay, let's affect our lives now and forever. Okay? And don't look at one little qualification and kind of like dismiss it. But let's, let's just like, let's look at this. Just see what this says. Um, 24. 6. These are great verses. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flat. 6, Proverbs 6, verse. 24, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Interesting. Don't even let it get in your heart. Wow, that is good, isn't it? Like you love something, you love, you have God as your object of who loves you and you love, and you don't even let it in your heart. You can't even entertain it in, inside of your own closed doors, okay? Inside of your own mind, you can't even entertain it. That's good. Neither let her take thee with your eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Like our lives, the adulteress is looking for the precious life. 
There's something about, you could say, virginity. There's something about purity, about holiness. There's something Satan hates about someone that's walking after God. Okay? And this is, this can be a huge issue. You know, sexuality can actually, what we'll see down here later, just it, it cause an incredible feeling of, of dirt and filth in our soul. And uh, it's very difficult to escape. Okay? And men and women, doesn't matter. Okay? Precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes and not be burned? Remember, we're talking about the qualification, the husband of one wife. We're kind of, you know, like kind of like trying to put out the fire before the fire starts, right? That's a better way to deal with it, isn't it? Like right now, today. Can you put can you put like adultery? Can you put something in my mind? Like, can you put fire in my mind and my mind doesn't get burnt? You can't. If we put fire in this classroom, something's going to get burnt in this classroom. And that's what it's saying here. Okay? Okay, his clothes will be burned, and his feet not be burnt. He that goeth to his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her, shall not, whosoever touches her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he seal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whosoever committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroys his own soul. It's like, you know, the, in the other example, like if you steal something, they come and they take it away, right? They come and they take it away. They, they take it back from you like seven times. But with the, it's like it happens automatically. They don't even have to find you. It's just like your, your soul is destroyed. No one has to know about it. Okay? It's done, it's done its damage. And this is what, you know, what we're talking about, right? Okay, this is so, this is so healthy for our lives. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we... We talked about two. We got 13 more to go. So let's take a break, a quick break. We've got a list of 38 points here, and man, we're really cooking. Okay, so okay, so let's take a break and come back in two minutes, okay? No, 10 minutes. We'll take 10 minutes.